Moving on now to introduce our speaker, Sharo Khamon Joseb. He's been a faculty member of the Wilmot Institute since 2015. He's been working through the tablets to the kings and the various other tablets in Summons of Lord of Hosts. And we've already run three different courses by him. Uh, the first course, the first two courses, one was on the Lohe Sultan and one was on the Surai Muluk. Then there was another course uh, covering the Lohe Rais, the Surai Rais, and the Lohe Fo'ad, which uh, those two tablets were addressed to two prominent Ottoman um, officials, uh, ministers. Sometimes they were the prime minister and sometimes they were the foreign minister for the Ottoman Empire. We are now turning to two courses in 2022. One course, uh, the one we're talking about today, will cover uh, three of the monarchs. And then uh, in the fall, we'll run another course, which will cover the others, uh, which are what? We've got uh, the uh, Pope, Pope Pius IX, the uh, Franz Josef of Austrian Hungary, Austria-Hungary Empire, and Kaiser Wilhelm of the German uh, Empire. So we'll have that one in the fall. Uh, the talk today is open to the public, but the other three in this series are for people who are taking the course. And if you're interested in taking the course about uh, these particular monarchs, uh, you can go to our website, wilmetinstitute.org, and find the registration link. The registration is still open. So without further uh, discussion, I will turn this over to Sharoch and uh, welcome him. Thank you so much for joining us, Sharoch. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stockman. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here again. This is the, the fourth uh, course in uh, the study of the Baha'u'llah's Letters to the Kings. Um, it is entitled, God Summons Europe. Um, these are individual, we were going to be examining individual tablets revealed by Baha'u'llah uh, to prominent monarchs of the Europe, European continent, uh, who at, in the, the mid-19th century was really the epicenter of the, the political powers um, of the world. Um, so today we're going to be looking at Baha'u'llah's first tablet to Napoleon III, uh, he's the only monarch that was addressed by Baha'u'llah twice. Um, although all the monarchs were addressed collectively in Surah Al-Muluk or Surah of the Kings, but uh, most of the, uh, the monarchs, with the exception of him and one of the prime ministers, who was not a monarch, uh, namely Ali Pasha, the Turkish prime minister, who was addressed also twice. But uh, Napoleon III was was actually addressed twice here. So this is the first tablet to Napoleon III. Now, now this tablet, um, as you will, many of you may know, we have never had the full uh, English translation of it. In fact, the text, the original text of the tablet, uh, was not even published in its original language uh, till about fifteen years ago. Uh, so it is a relatively uh, new tablet, if you will, as far as Baha'i studies goes. Uh, so, and here today I will be presenting a, a uh, full translation, a provisional translation, incorporating the excerpts that Shoghi Effendi translated and included in his general letter to the Baha'is of the West entitled The Promised Days Come. I'll talk to that. Uh, about that a little bit uh, more as we get closer to that. So before uh, anything else, I think it would be appropriate to introduce the recipient of this tablet, the addressee, if you will, Napoleon III. Um, it's important for historical context to, to know who he was, what was his background, uh, because there are references that are made by Baha'u'llah that, that may be subtle, particularly in his second tablet, which is much uh, lengthier than the first one. And uh, uh, so knowing the events of his life and how he came to power and, and, and his uh, genealogy, because we all we're, most people are familiar with the great Napoleon Bonaparte, but oftentimes people are not... Uh, 
sure who Napoleon III was. Most of the time, they don't even know if there was a Napoleon II, and I'll explain all that. So today I'm going to uh, talk about his early life and early reign up to the Crimean War, and then um, we will uh, examine the rest of his, uh, his reign uh, up to his, basically, his uh, downfall and, and, again, his, his, his death. Uh, and and how uh, everything came came to to a head, basically based on Baha'u'llah's prophecies uh, and warnings uh, in the in the second seminar in the of this course. So this course will include uh, four webinars. This is the first webinar. The second will cover uh, Baha'u'llah's second tablet to Napoleon the uh, third, and then for the third and the fourth. Uh, webinars, we will be examining the tablet to Tsar Alexander II of Russia, were contemporaries, these were all contemporary monarchs, and uh, finally the tablet to Queen Victoria. So uh, about Napoleon III, he was born Charles Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, he was named after his father Louis, uh, and uh, of course his uncle Napoleon. Uh, which became, again, a very popular within the family, as you can see. So he was born in Paris on April 20th, 1808. Uh, he was the youngest of the three sons of Louis Bonaparte, the younger brother of Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. And uh, his mother, uh, it's worth mentioning, was Hortense de Boarnay, daughter of Josephine de Boarnay. Uh, you all have heard about uh, the uh, Empress of France, the famous Empress of France, Josephine, who was the love of Napoleon, um, and, uh, but she was previously married. So her daughter from the previous marriage was married to Napoleon Great's younger brother. So that's, so, so Napoleon, um, his younger brother, Louis Bonaparte, was the father of Charles Louis, that the, the individual who Baha'u'llah addressed. And uh, his mother was the daughter of, uh, of Empress uh, Josephine. Uh, so in a way, uh, it made his uncle, if you will, he was, he was his uncle, but he was also... Um, Again, related, you know, through the family, uh, in, you know, because his brother had married the daughter of his, you know, um, the stepdaughter of his brother, if you will. Uh, so uh, after the fall, of course, of an exile of his uncle, Charles Louis and his family were forced into exile, uh, settling for many years in Switzerland. They couldn't be obviously in France because... Uh, uh, they had become persona non grata after after the uh, the downfall of the great Napoleon and his exile to Saint Helen. Um, as his parents were already separated by then, uh, Charles Louis lived with his mother for the most part until her death in 1837. In 1832, when the uh, Duke of uh, Reichstadt uh, also known as Napoleon II, uh, who was Napoleon's only surviving son. Uh, he was not from Josephine. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the biography of Napoleon, uh, Josephine had become barren uh, and as a result could not produce an heir. So towards the end of his reign, the great Napoleon remarried uh, divorced Josephine reluctantly and married Marie Louise. Um, and from that union, a son, an heir, was born, um, who unfortunately uh, did not live very long. He lived to be about 21 years of age, but uh, lived most of his uh, life in, uh, in, in, in exile. I think he was only officially an emperor once uh, Napoleon abdicated for about a month or so. Um, 
so when he passed away in 1832, who was in exile at the time uh, in, uh, in, in Austria, um, then Charles Louis became the de facto heir of the dynasty and the leader of the Bonapartist cause. Between 1833 to 1839, he began writing more of his political philosophies and his vision for, for himself and what he, he, you know, he was to do. He was, uh, at that time, he had become very much of a socialist uh, and wanted to uh, pick up the cause of refor reforming the, uh, what they, what his uncle had had begun, but in a more of a, uh, a socialist approach at the time. But deep down, he obviously felt that he uh, was the heir to the Bonaparte uh, dynasty, which sh should be restored to France once again. Uh, in one of in in one instance, he wrote, "I believe that from time to time, men are created." whom I call volunteers of providence, in whose hands are pl placed the destiny of their countries. I believe I am one of those men. If I am wrong, I can perish uselessly. If I'm right, then providence will put me into a position to fulfill my mission. It's very interesting because later on in a retro, retro, uh, in a, in a, in a retroactive way, if, you, if we look back at this, in retrospect, we will see that, you know, some of this vision came true, but some of it also was part of his downfall as well. In the fall of 1836, he initiated a coup against the French government of King Louis Philippe uh, from the city of Strasbourg. However, the coup was very short lived and Charles Louis had to flee back to Switzerland um, the French king, uh, Louis Philippe, um, was enraged by this brazen yet ill-conceived attempt by the Bonapartists to overthrow his government. And as such, he demanded that the Swiss government extradite uh, Charles Louis back to France, but the Swiss refused, claiming he was a Swiss citizen, which was true, and that he was also an enlisted officer in the Swiss army. But when the French threatened the Swiss with war, uh, Charles Louis decided to voluntarily leave Switzerland, embarking on a multi-nation tour of Britain, Brazil, and the United States. While traveling in the USA, which has a very interesting um, story about some, who he met in the, well, he was in the United States, but we don't have time for it. Uh, while well, he was traveling in 1837, uh, he was informed of his mother's illness. So he hurried back to Switzerland and was at his mother's bedside when she passed away in August of 1837. After his mother's death, having inherited from her a large fortune, he moved to London in October of 1838 and began connecting with London's high society, including the future prime minister, uh, Benjamin Disraeli, and the renowned British scientist, Michael Faraday. Uh, Napoleon was very interested in science, and we will see that when uh, later he was imprisoned, he, he, he conducted many uh, uh, scientific experiments. So uh, Michael Faraday, had influenced them, you know, to become very interested in, in science. And then uh, when he becomes an emperor as well, he, he gave precedence to many, uh, to a lot of scientists and, uh, you know, promoted uh, the, the sort of the industrialization and development of the sciences in France as well. While in London, Charles Louis began planning for his second attempt to overthrow the French monarchy of King Louis Philippe. In the summer of 1840, he decided to launch his second attempt to stir a popular uprising against the French government. However, this time the attempted insurrection was literally dead on arrival. 
Uh, on August 6, 1840, Charles Louis and about 60 militia men who he had hired sailed across the English Channel and landed on the port of Boulogne. Um, unfortunately for them, soon after their landing, through several misfortunate occurrences, the small band of insurrectionists were arrested, including Napoleon himself, uh, by the French authorities. They were put in jail and uh, they, were, they were all uh, tried in the court of law. Uh, but more than anything, it was the way it occurred. It was so embarrassing, the outcome of this. And uh, he became uh, this, this sort of second coup attempt uh, because he was as a, as a Bonaparte, uh, he still was in the eye of the public, you know. So uh, the, the, the press particularly lampooned him, both the British and the French press, uh, because of this second attempt that was very pathetic, uh, you know, and, and, and one of them wrote, one of the newspapers wrote, this surpasses comedy. One doesn't kill crazy people. One just locks them up. And in fact, that's what they, they did. For his insurrection attempt, uh, Charles Louis was tried and sentenced to life imprisonment. After his trial, he was transferred to the fortress prison at Ham in northern France, where he began his life sentence in October of 1840. While in prison at Ham, he began writing political essays and commentaries, even publishing a book in 1844 on the causes of poverty in the French industrial working class and how to eliminate it. These writings may made him quite popular among the French intelligentsia and would help him with his political aspirations in the years to come. However, he was um, chomping at the bit to get out. He did not want to spend the rest of his life a, a prisoner. So he was a, quite a schemer, if you will. And uh, uh, so he planned his escape and for a number of months, and uh, through elaborate planning and a bit of luck, uh, he managed to escape from the prison on the 25th of May, 1846. So he served six years of his life sentence uh, at, the, at the Ham prison. And then from there, he escaped uh, to London and uh, kind of reconnected himself uh, quickly with the British high society. And once again, began <laughs> preparing for his future return to his homeland. Uh, for him, this was, a, this was a lifelong dream and he felt that it was his destiny to get back to France. Um, but obviously he had had two unfortunate uh, attempts uh, that had landed, the last one had landed him in, in prison. So he needed an opportunity that really uh, would be safe for him to get back into France. And this came uh, in 1848, uh, as you know, there, was, there were European revolutions all across the European continent, with the exception of UK and, uh, and Russia. Um, but all, the, all the, uh, uh, um, the, the nations, the other nations went through a revolution. Now this, especially in France, uh, the, the government of Louis Philippe was overthrown and a uh, second republic was declared. So this gave Charles Louis the political opportunity he was looking for to make a bid for the leadership of this newly formed French second republic. Through intricate and calculating political planning, he managed to get his name uh, in as a candidate for the presidential election of the newly established French Republic. And uh, being blessed with the surname of Bonaparte at a time of great national patriotism towards his uncle, uh, the great Emperor Napoleon, Charles Louis won the election for presidency in a landslide. In fact, he received 70% of the votes cast. And so he was declared the president of the Second Republic uh, on uh, December uh, of 1840. Now, although 
um, he was held in low regard by most of his contemporary political rivals. Uh, he was very much unlike his, fa uh, his, his uncle. He was not very charismatic. Um, he was, uh, you know, someone who was very muted. He kept his card. He had a poker face. He, had a, he kept his uh, card, so to speak, very close to his chest, um, did not share. He was very enigmatic. Um, so, and he was really not as good a statesman as his uncle was, uh, but again, one of the things, his virtues was, he proved himself to be one of the most uh, able politicians uh, of the 19th century. He was very, um, he was great in his planning and his tactics and his various machinations to bring about uh, what he desired uh, to, be, to be achieved. Although Charles Louis had achieved a tremendous milestone in his political career by becoming the president of the new republic, he was not content with this, obviously. Deep down, his ultimate goal was to achieve the absolute power of an emperor like his uncle. And as, as he had said, that he felt that that was his God-given uh, mandate, if you will, and it's something that uh, it was his birthright. Um, on the day he took, in fact, on the day he took the presidential oath of office, he told an old friend that um, we are not at the summit yet. This is only a stop on the way, a terrace where we may rest a moment to get at the horizon. After his confirmation as the president of France, against the advice of some of his political associates, he took the title Prince President, and instead of wearing plain clothes, as other politicians did, he chose the uniform of the general-in-chief of the National Guard. So again, he wanted to revive the old style of what his uncle had so uh, you know he was really going against the the popular grain but he didn't care uh charles louis knew one of the things that he knew uh so painfully if you will at the time that in order to remain in power he would have to alter the new constitution which dictated that the president's term of office was four years and, and once his term ended, he was not eligible for re-election to a second term. This was part of the new constitution in order to not, not allow any uh, way uh, of, of, of establishing some kind of a dictatorship. Uh, uh, they said, you know, the, the presidency is going to be four years and that's it. Uh, so he, he obviously had issues with it. So what he did for the next uh, few years, Years, or the remaining part of his term, he, he campaigned vigorously to have the French Legislative Assembly revise the Constitution. He, his, his claim was also that he couldn't, all the reforms that he had in mind, he couldn't do it in, 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 the, in, in the time of his presidency. And, and he would be uh, restricted and uh, circumscribed by the term of office. Um, but uh, unfortunately, his hopes were dashed in the summer of 1851 when the legislature uh, unequivocally voted to reject his request for, uh, for changing the Constitution or amending the Constitution to extend another term for the presidency. So uh, seeing no further hope to remain in power legally, uh, Charles Louis organized a massive coup which again, he planned with many of his loyalists. And on December 2nd, 1851, he dissolved the legislature and arrested a large number of his political opponents. He did it overnight. He basically occupied Paris, had troops occupy Paris the evening before, and it was very well organized. And, um, and, and so by the morning, you know, they had already arrested uh, you know, a very large number of uh, opponents. Um, he announced to the French people that as their president, he was restoring universal suffrage, which had been revoked previously by the Legislative Assembly and would seek their approval through a plebiscite. 
uh, of fundamental changes in the constitution. So he, he basically made the coup, uh, even though it was for, for his own end, but he, he, he told the public that he did it uh, for them because he felt that their rights were being violated. And as the president of the people, he felt that he couldn't uh, you know, hold back and, and just watch you know, uh, the, the rights of the people of France be eroded by the, uh, by the conservatives in the in this legislative assembly, and hence the coup d'etat. Now, the coup d'etat of 1851 effectively made Charles Louis Napoleon dictator of France. So he was one step closer to what he wanted to achieve. Opposition was ruthlessly suppressed in Paris and the provinces. It is estimated that about 100,000 people were arrested. And by the end of the year, over 20,000 were either sentenced to imprisonment or exiled to, to the various colonies, the French colonies. So, you know, he, he basically cleaned out house. Um, on December 21st, 1851, as he had promised, a plebiscite was held asking the French people to approve the coup d'etat and to grant the president the right to draw up a new constitution. Uh, the French people overwhelmingly voted in favor of the president's actions and a new constitution. So on January 14th, soon thereafter, uh, a new constitution modeled directly on the consulate of the first Napoleon was introduced. It declared that the chief of the state was responsible to the nation, but at the same time, it gave him free and unfettered authority to conduct the nation's affair, essentially making him an emperor. So Charles Louis had finally won. He was soon to claim his position as Emperor Napoleon III of France. And in fact, uh, when, they, when, when the um, constitution, when they amended the constitution, the word the president was in there, but in, 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 uh, you know, in few months, what he did, he actually just, had the, the, the name of the president changed to the emperor. Uh, that's the way, because it was already planned. And, uh, and even though it had gone through the assembly, but the drafting of the constitution was done by a small group of loyalists to him and, and then was taken to the, to the legislature, which was also uh, heavily packed uh, by his supporters. So this is a photo of one of his first uh, portraits as the emperor, uh, Napoleon III. And he took the title Napoleon III to give validation uh, to uh, Napoleon Great's son as being the second Napoleon. Now his foreign policy, it's worth mentioning, and we're just gonna talk about his foreign policy uh, for the remainder of the 1850s up to about 1860, because there was a bit of a shift uh, after that, and I'll be covering that in the next uh, webinar. At the time of officially becoming the emperor of France on December 2nd, 1852, which was exactly a year after his coup d'etat that sealed his dictatorship, Napoleon III knew that he still had to fulfill the promises of national glory associated with his name. There was so much, the name Napoleon, was such a great pride and he had uh, ridden on the coattail of his uncle, if you will, uh, and, and you know, having the name and having the kind of the legacy. And by, by then now the, uh, the body of uh, Napoleon had been uh, brought back from St. Helena and had been entombed in Fontainebleau, I believe the palace. So, you know, he was the great uh, hero uh, the great Napoleon to the French people. And, uh, but so he needed to show that he was like his uncle. So again, he began looking at ways of bringing back France to its former glory. So as the Supreme ruler of France, he spent the greater part of the 1850s and early 1860s to restore France's old position of ascendancy in Europe. For achieving this ascendancy, uh, Napoleon III knew that uh, to regain back French ascendancy, 
in Europe, he would have to break the restrictions imposed on France by the treatises of 1815, which established the concert of Europe after the final downfall of his uncle, Emperor Napoleon I. He was also aware that the chief supporter of those crippling treatises uh, against France in the mid 19th century was Russia, um, and which was using them uh, to establish its own ascendancy on the continent. Now, as one historian puts it, it was Napoleon III's good fortune that he came to power at a time when the fear of Russia overshadowed fear of France among the states of Europe. And he soon discovered that France would not lack allies in pursuing an anti-Russian policy. Since, since the British uh, were the, 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 the fiercest opponent to Russia and feared the Russian threat to the European balance of power more than any other nation uh, in Europe, Napoleon began establishing an alliance with Queen Victoria and the, um, the British government against Russia. And this came to a head with the alliances that came together uh, for the Crimean War. Now, um, without going into too much detail about the Crimean War, uh, it was a war that was there to prevent Russia from controlling the Ottoman Empire, which ruled over the Balkans and Constantinople at that time. Uh, and that was the reason that this war was waged. And uh, Russia was very powerful. Its navy was more advanced at the time than the Ottomans. And the Ottomans would have just completely collapsed if the, uh, the French and the British had not come to their aid. Although a terrible war with heavy casualties on both sides, it was the alliance between France and Britain that secured victory for the Ottoman Empire over its arch nemesis, Russia. However, the true political winner in the Crimean War was France, who managed to reestablish itself as one of the great powers of Europe. So this was one of the, 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 the first great achievement by Napoleon III. Uh, it brought glory to France because it brought a victory, even though it was really not like the wars of his uncle, but you know, he needed to, to show them that France could now stand with the rest of the nations. So by doing this, France now became one of the, one of the great powers uh, of Europe. Now, turning to Baha'u'llah's summon to Napoleon III, uh, which was obviously towards the end of his reign and in the late 1860s. So I want to bring you back now to uh, uh, Baha'u'llah in the last year of his um, sojourn in his exile in the city of Edirna. And uh, here Baha'u'llah addressed two exclusive letters to Emperor Napoleon III. Um, the first letter was revealed and sent to the French emperor during the last few months of Baha'u'llah's exile in the European Turkish city of Edirna or Adrianople, if you will. Um, this was likely after the revelation of the Lohe Sultan, the tablet, Baha'u'llah's tablet to Nasruddin Shah, which Baha'u'llah revealed in Adirna, but kept it to himself. Uh, in fact, he, he kind of teased some of his followers that he had revealed this special tablet to, to the king of Iran, to the Shah, but he, he would say that its messenger was not created as yet. And as we know the story that, uh, you know, uh, Badi, uh, Abu Zurgen Eshaburi, was destined to become this, this great courier, this great messenger uh, to take this uh, uh, letter of Baha'u'llah. So the first letter of all the kings was revealed by Baha'u'llah uh, and, and addressing Nasruddin Shah. The, this would have been after the Surah Muluk. The Surah Muluk, as, as I spoke in my previous course, was revealed in 1866, uh, which addressed all the kings and Sultan of Turkey as well, and, and many others. It's a very lengthy 50 pages 
long in translation, but the next biggest tablet uh, to the kings and the, the lengthiest uh, to a single monarch was Lohe Sultan, the tablet to the Shah of Iran, which I also did a course on through the Wilmet Institute. Uh, it's on YouTube. For those of you who are interested, you can go and uh, have a look. Uh, so that was, uh, so the, the, um, the tablet to Nasiruddin Shah, we, we think that was revealed. There's no colophon, unfortunately, uh, for many of these tablets uh, that actually gave the, 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 the date of revelation, but through uh, histor historical investigation and narrowing down the, the facts, um, you know, it was revealed in the early months of uh, 1868. Now, the next tablet to, to the individual monarch, to an individual monarch, was uh, uh, Emperor uh, Napoleon III's first tablet, which we're going to be uh, looking at. So, and then there was the second letter to Napoleon III, uh, which was revealed much lengthier. And we're going to talk about that and, and, and explore that and study that at the next webinar. And this one was, um, was uh, revealed a few months after Baha'u'llah uh, was exiled to the penal colony of Akka while Baha'u'llah was in solitary confinement. That tablet was revealed and was, was sent to Napoleon. Um, now, another thing to mention, Baha'u'llah's first tablet to Napoleon III is rather unique in comparison to all his other individual summons and proclamations to the rulers of the world. Um, how is it um, different? Unlike the other summons, its tone is rather mild and non-proclamatory. In fact, the Guardian uses the word um, non provocative. All the other tablets are very direct, very proclamatory, and, you know, this God speaking, it's, it's revealed, it's, they're revealed in the language that God speaking. But in this tablet, which you will see, um, which Baha'u'llah used to really the test the sincerity of the, uh, of the emperor, because he had claimed that he was a um, basically an advocate for the downtrod, you know, a, a basically someone who was the champion of the, uh, you know, the dispossessed and the oppressed. Uh, and here, here he was tested uh, and we will see that. So the author of this tablet, as you will see, uh, is, comes across as a meek, and oppressed holy man, and not as the supreme manifestation of God summoning God's vassals, as Baha'u'llah refers to the kings, and apprising them of his divine mission. So you will see that. that and, and, and yet it's very interesting because this period, during the Adrianople period, this was Baha'u'llah's, the period of Baha'u'llah's uh, public proclamation which had begun. I mean, you look at the tone, for example, of Surah Muluk revealed two years earlier. It is absolutely awe-inspiring and it's very uh, powerful uh, and challenging. Here, this tablet, he's trying to test to see, you know, how Napoleon is going to respond. Um, in his analysis of Baha'u'llah's proclamation to the French emperor, Shoghi Effendi in, in The Promised Day is Come, in fact, writes, in his first tablet to Napoleon III, Baha'u'llah wishing to test the sincerity of the emperor's motives and deliberately assuming a meek and unprovocative tone had, after expatiating on the sufferings he had endured, addressed him in the following words. And then the Guardian quotes an excerpt from uh, this first tablet, which we're going to be uh, placing into the tablet. And that's paragraph 123 of The Promised Days Come. In paragraph 10, about the date of revelation of the tablet, again, we don't have a colophon, so we don't know the exact 
date, but I think we can narrow it down to about two months, if you will. Uh, in paragraph 10 of the tablet, Baha'u'llah states that it has been 20 and five years since the persecution against him and his co-religionist, meaning the Babis, had begun, putting the revelation of the tablet sometime in the early months of the Muslim year 1285. So the Babs, the year of the Babs um, declaration is 1260. You add 25 years to that, you get 1285. Now the year 1285 began on April 24th, 1868. So the tablet could not have been revealed any sooner than late April. So that's what we know. Um, and we know that it was also uh, revealed in Adrianople and Baha'u'llah was exiled in August uh, to, you know, so, so again, from late April to early August, that would be the window. Now, let's see if we can narrow it down. I believe since the tablet makes no mention of the of the Farman of the Sultan or the Sultan's edict of Baha'u'llah's exile to Akka, which was issued on July 26, 1868. The revelation of the tablet was sometime then between late April to late July of 1868. But again, that's, we don't know, but you know, it's good. We do have a much, uh, much narrower window with some of the other tablets, we don't. Um, and Baha'u'llah has testified in uh, himself or has stated uh, in the epistle to the son of the wolf that he did send the first tablet from Adrianople. Uh, and then he got, he received the response um, of sorts uh, when he was in, in Akka. So, and we will explore that in the next session. Um, a little bit more about the external features of the tablet, as we shall observe shortly, Baha'u'llah's first tablet to Napoleon III is not very long. In fact, it is revealed in both Arabic and Persian, very similar to, to uh, uh, Lohe Sultan, the tablet to Nasiruddin Shah, which began in Arabic and then the middle part of it is in Persian and then the ending part is also in Arabic. Uh, so this, this tablet is almost half and half, as you will see. Uh, the first half of it, uh, or the exordium, as I like to call it, of the tablet, which is essentially a prayer. It's very fascinating, but it is a prayer. So he begins this tablet with a long prayer, uh, very touching, very moving prayer. Um, it is revealed in Arabic. And the second half, where Baha'u'llah actually addresses the, the emperor, is composed in Persian. Um, as I said, its, its style is very similar to that of Lohe Sultan, which was revealed a few months earlier, but was dispatched a year later from Akka. Now, let's look at the tablet itself. Baha'u'llah begins Lohe Napoleon. This is actually how Shavya Fendi transliterated uh, this in the list of Baha'u'llah's tablets. Um, uh, so the tablet begins in Arabic with these words, and I'll share with you the first couple of lines. Illa Zakraka Wafi Tawajohi Illa Jahatin Illa Jahati Fadlika Wa Mawa Hibika Wa Maratu Illa Maratahu Le Abadika. The English translation of this excerpt that I just read, which is the opening sentence, the first couple sentences begins, he is God with the invocation, he is God, exalted is he in his grace and justice. He verily is the one whose help is sought by all men and who is the object of their true reliance. Then begins the prayer. Glorified art thou, O Lord, my God, thou knowest well that my sole aim in raising my voice hath been to make mention of thee 
and to extol thy virtues, fixing my gaze only in the direction of thy grace and favor and wishing for naught else but what thou hast wished for thy servants and thy people. I have moreover sought only to carry out the mission thou didst enjoin upon me as the voice that proclaimeth thy virtues and thy praise and have desired only what thou hast desired through thy decree. I have breathed no word unto thy people save that which thou hast commanded me to utter and no epistle have I sent to anyone except for the sole purpose of protection of thy creatures and preservation of thy servants. Otherwise, I swear by thyself, the most exalted, the most high, I have no intention in self-preservation, nor do I seek any protection for myself in thy realm. I have offered up my whole being in thy path, seeking only the glorification of thy word. Thou art well aware, O oh my God, what hath befallen these thy servants, and yet despite this, I have sought only to reveal thy revelation among thy servants and promote thy sovereign might amidst thy creatures. O Lord, thou knowest full well that thy loved ones have been cut off from every path and have been encompassed by manifold adversities from every direction. Indeed, they have suffered such woes, the like of which no one hath experienced in the past. How many the heads which were born on spears in thy path? How numerous the breasts which were lacerated by arrows for the sake of thy love? How many times were the blood of thy loved ones spilled upon thy earth? How often has a sister lamented and mourned her separation from her brother? How numerous the fathers who wailed in grief over the murder of their sons, how many the suckling babes who were cruelly detached from their mother's breasts. All this hath befallen these wronged ones after they, one and all, have acknowledged thy unity and testify to thy oneness. I beseech thee, O my Lord, by thy most excellent titles, and by thy most perfect and exalted word to help these wronged ones enter the stronghold of thy protection so that no one could deal with them unjustly any longer or seize them with tyranny. Thou art verily the almighty, the all glorious, whose help is implored by all men. Here ends the first section or the exordium of the tablet, which is composed in Arabic, as I mentioned earlier. The remaining paragraphs of the tablet are revealed in Persian. And this is where Baha'u'llah now uh, begins to address the emperor directly. What this servant humbly presents before thee is that it hath now been 20 and five years since a group of God's servants have had no restful night nor found a moment of peace and security. They have been beset at all times by the onslaught of hatred and have been tormented by manifold expressions of violence and anger. How many the children who have become fatherless and similarly how many fathers who have lost their children? How numerous the mothers who have shed tears of anguish in their separation from their offspring, and how many the children who have cried and lamented over the loss of their mothers. Numerous are the young babes who have drunk the cup 
of, of martyrdom. No mercy has been shown to these people, man and woman alike. How frequent were the nights when the beasts of the fields and birds of the skies peacefully rested in their nests, whereas these servants of God, in fear and consternation, found no abode of safety and security. Numerous are the men from among these people who at eventide were possessed of utmost wealth and affluence but when the morning came, found themselves in utter abasement and destitution, as their property had been plundered and their earthly possessions ransacked. No land remaineth that hath not been stained by the blood of these wronged ones, and no locality could be found which hath not become the place of martyrdom for countless numbers of these hapless people. How many women who after being made captive were dragged from place to place and from city to city, and likewise, how many men who were sold for a sum of money. Numerous are also those who out of fear ran off into the wilderness and none knoweth whither have they gone, and still others today remain incarcerated. Lamentations of these victims of tyranny reverberate by day and by night, and the cries of these captives can be heard at all times. All this hath occurred without any wrongdoing on the part of these people. The following paragraph um, 13 and more than half of paragraph 14 of this tablet has been rendered into English by Shoghi Effendi and quoted by him in paragraph 123 of The Promised Day is Come. So here begins Shoghi Effendi's uh, translation. Two statements graciously uttered by the king of the age have reached the ears of these wronged ones. These pronouncements are in truth the king of all pronouncements, the like of which have never been heard from any sovereign. The first was the answer given the Russian government when it inquired why the war, the Crimean War, was waged against it. Thou didst reply, the cry of the oppressed who without guilt or blame were drowned in the Black Sea wakened me at dawn. Wherefore, I took up arms against thee. So Baha'u'llah is quoting what was published in the newspapers about what Napoleon had claimed that he was going to war to protect the innocent. So here, God is challenging him. These oppressed ones, however, have suffered a greater wrong and are in greater distress, where, whereas the trials inflicted upon those people lasted but one day, the troubles borne by these servants have continued for 20 and five years, every moment of which has held for us a grievous affliction. Now, the reference to the Trials. What happened in the Crimean War uh, was that the um, the Ru Russia sank a couple of uh, ships, the Ottoman fleet from the Ottoman fleet at the beginning, which kind of triggered the war, and uh, and people obviously were killed when when the, those ships uh, were were sunk. But these were sailors, uh, and they were in war. But Napoleon had claimed that. The Turks were innocent, and he was coming to their aid against the big bear, the big Russia, uh, you know, who, who everyone had come to uh, despise in Europe at the time. So he was, he was using that as a, as, a, as a political chip, if you will, and a pretext to, to, to come uh, enter the war in, 
alliance with Britain. And, and, and with Britain, obviously, uh, by, by himself, uh, France, would have, it would have been very hard. But now with the Great Britain and their fleet and everything, I mean, Russia stood no chance. So here, but yet politically, he was trying to say, oh, I just came in to protect the innocent. So Baha'u'llah challenges it. He says, he says those people, you know, they're, they're suffering. Yes, they, they were innocent and they suffered and they were killed. Uh, but it was only one day, you know, whereas the trials inflicted upon, you know, these people has continued for 25 years. Uh, you know, so Baha'u'llah makes a comparison and says that if you, if you went to the aid of those people, I mean, naturally, you got to come to our aid. Uh, so, again, it's, it's, it's a very, very clever <laughs> way that God is, is, is kind of examining the sincerity of the words of Napoleon III. Now, Baha'u'llah continues, the other weighty statement, which was indeed a wondrous statement manifested to the world, was this. And again, Baha'u'llah is quoting uh, the, the emperors. Ours is the responsibility to avenge the oppressed and succor the helpless. I mean, that's, that, that it's done now. I mean, it's like Napoleon has got himself into a, okay, you're the, you're the champion of the oppressed and the succor uh, of the helpless. Here we are. There is no better you know, group for you to rescue and to support. And then, you know, Baha'u'llah continues, the fame of the emperor's justice and fairness has brought hope to a great many souls. It beseemeth the king of the age to inquire into the condition of such as have been wronged, and it behooveth him to extend his care to the weak. Verily, there hath not been, nor is there now on earth, anyone as oppressed as we are, or as helpless as these wanderers. Beautiful, beautifully translated, beautifully expressed here. This is the challenge that Baha'u'llah has very gently, very lovingly, very kindly is putting to this great emperor at the height of his power. So this ends Shoghi Effendi's translation. The tablet continues. Baha'u'llah says, For all beings, whether human or animal, wild beasts or birds, all abide safely and securely within their sanctuary except these feeble souls who are at every hour bound by the shackles of enmity and are ruthlessly tied down by the heavy chains of hatred and violence. We can no longer tolerate such cruelty, and our hearts are no longer filled with patience and resignation. It's very interesting. This last statement, our hearts, um, you know, we can no longer, you know, tolerate, I mean, basically, uh, you know, as they say in Persian, the 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 knife has hit the bone if you will you know it's just you know 25 years we've been as patient as we could be but now we need someone to help us so this is what baha'u'llah and then he ends the tablet perhaps with the most uh poignant uh supplication here here you know the manifestation of god is supplicating to God's vassal, we supplicate thy majesty to gaze upon these servants with his mercy so that we may all take refuge beneath the shelter of his sovereign protection. And with that, he ends the tablet. So I think um, our time has uh, just about expired. Um, I have more things to say, but I will say it, you know, in, in the next, uh, the way the tablet was re received, how Baha'u'llah got this tablet to Napoleon. He did receive it. And, um, and, and, and the Guardian has also made mention of 
the response of the of the emperor, but um, it it uh, obviously um, evoked this uh, this next tablet, which is absolutely awe inspiring and very much lengthier. It's probably one of the lengthiest tablets to a single monarch next to uh, the tablet to uh, Nasruddin Shah. So at this point, I'll take some questions from, uh, from those who are present and the students of the course. Um, Dr. Stockman, if you can come, I think I have to end uh, my screen sharing here. And then um, I think I am, um, are, we, are we here? Yeah, you can hear okay. me. Yeah, you should yeah, be able I to. I can hear you. Yeah, we, we've got a few questions. And it's uh, some people want to know whether the original tablet sent to the uh, Napoleon has been found, whether it's in the archives in France. Do we know anything about how it got translated into French or anything of uh, that kind? Yes, of it, it was. Um, I'll tell you this. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit more. What Baha'u'llah did, he actually confidentially contacted a, a, a uh, very prominent a uh, French politician who was also the author of a recently published book on the Babis, uh, namely Comte de Gabineau. Gabineau had served as the ambassador to Iran for one year. And at the time of the revelation in 1868 of this tablet, he was the ambassador to Greece. Uh, so Greece was very oh, wow. close. And remember um, the Ottomans, had a, had a great relationship with the, with the French. Now, there's been always questions about uh, why Gabineau, okay? And, and again, we don't know for sure, um, but Baha'u'llah does say that he contacted his minister. He does not mention, you know, uh, the name of the minister, uh, but there is evidence, there's historical evidence that that pretty much proves that it was come to Gabineau, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, Gabineau himself, in a correspondence with the Austrian ambassador, says that he received a confidential letter from Baha'u'llah. Hmm. Okay, um, and, and so so that really kind of puts it in that. Now there is there would have been other channels why Baha'u'llah did not use, for example, the French. Uh, you know, council uh, or the, the, the French ambassador as well, you know, in, at the sublime port. Remember, Baha'u'llah was obviously, there's several reasons, but there's three good reasons that I will give you here, is that um, obviously Baha'u'llah is in exile and uh, he wanted this to actually get to the emperor, no matter what, that would not get bogged down or filtered out by the politicians, you know, and not get to the emperor. So, and, and if you recall, uh, Baha'u'llah had already castigated the, the last French ambassador to the sublime port, to, to, to the Ottoman, you know, to Istanbul, Marquis de Moustier. Now at this time, Marquis de Moustier had been elevated by Napoleon III to the foreign minister mm -hmm. of France. So, Obviously, and he, he had colluded with Mirza Hossein Khan Moshiro Dole, the Safir or the minister of Iran at the Sublime Port. So obviously he would not be friendly to Baha'u'llah. Okay, uh -huh. so that's one reason. The other reason is Gabineau had published uh, just three years earlier one of the most popular books uh, religion and philosophy in Central Asia, right. which, which, although it's very racist, it dedicates more than half the books to the Babi cause. And although the source is from a hostile source, uh, you know, but it is it was the first book that actually brought the Babi faith to the West, mm -hmm. if you will. And uh, it was actually this book that the young young E.G. Brown in, huh. in, in, in Cambridge University, or I think where he was, uh, he, he saw it in one of the libraries. And when, when he read it, he was inspired by it. So 
obviously Gabino was sympathetic to the to the to the Bobbies because he had dedicated more than half of his book to the you know to the, to the cause of the Bob uh, and the religion of the Bob. Even though, again, uh, like uh, Alam Nicola uh, criticized them for accuracy, it was not a very accurate description. But it was a description. So again, there was so obviously. Baha'u'llah felt that there was some empathy, you know, with Gabineau. The other thing is Gabineau was very popular amongst the French. So he knew that if he asked him to, uh, you know, to take that to the emperor, he probably had the ear of the emperor because the emperor was very, probably was very proud of him for publishing. He was, you know, he was, he was, a, he was an individual who was very much a, a pro-emperor, uh, uh, you know. So, and he did, he actually, uh, you know, the way it sounds that he took it personally to him. And then, you know, he wrote back to Baha'u'llah saying that I have submitted your letter, but I haven't received the response, you know, from, you know, for it. But, you know, so I I'll talk about that. I'll bring what Baha'u'llah says in the epistle to the son of the wolf next time. So, so definitely, in my opinion, well, I shouldn't say definitely because we, we don't have conclusive evidence, but, you know, all signs point to the fact that he was uh, come to Gabineau that uh, assisted with the uh, transmission of this, this first tablet uh, to Emperor Napoleon III. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we don't. We do not have. Uh, I believe uh, uh, Mujan Momin uh, had uh, done the investigation when he wrote his book, his great book, uh, um, the Western Accounts, uh, which covers the first hundred years uh, of the Babi Baha'i religions, and there, there, there have in in French Foreign Office or even in the papers of uh, Gabineau that hasn't been so far anything has not been discovered that as as far as that but again we don't know i mean it may have been destroyed i mean napoleon may have just grabbed it and basically tore it and said this is this is garbage now i'll talk about why the response of the emperor may have been such as well because it may it had political motives as well but i'll, I'll save that for next time any other okay. questions yeah there's there's a few others one person asks where they can obtain the original, uh, the text of the original tablet, the original language text. The, 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 for those who read Farsi and Arabic, it was published very, very um, interesting and rather strange. Well, not strange in the sense that, um, and, and many, many people in the Baha'i world didn't know, uh, I, you know, it was discovered. Um, certainly wasn't announced by the House of Justice because I remember, uh, or the, the research department when, when it was published. I, I recall in the 90s and in, the, um, in, in early to 2000s as well, I, I wrote to the World Center asking for a copy because of my, my research. And they, they, they wrote back saying that there is a copy, but it's going to be published in future. Apparently others had asked, so they mm -hmm. didn't want to just, just release it to one or two individuals. So where it was published was actually very interesting. Um, some of you know uh, that Adib, well, we all know Adib Tarzada wrote four volumes, The Revelation of Baha'u'llah. Uh, the late Dr. Baher Forghani uh, was a great Persian scholar and an erudite Baha'i uh, who's now passed away from Australia, I believe. He translated uh, all four volumes of Adib Tarzada from English to Persian. And many of those tablets that uh, he had referred to um, in he, that Adib Tahirzadeh had referred to the the World Center uh, provided him with the uh, oh. actual copies of those tablets in the original. Right. So this was public. It is published in the second volume of the translation of. Oh of uh, Adib Tahirzadeh's Revelation of Baha'u'llah. That's where, <laughs> where, that's where I got it from, and that's where, where we, we have it. There's no other place that it has been oh, interesting. posted. Yeah. yeah, so they don't actually, haven't actually prepared it to publish it in a book of its own or a book, a book no, of translations. No. Is there anything adding it no. to someone's and, Lord of Hosts or anything and, like that? And you, 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 you know, now you can see why uh, Baha'u'llah, when he... Um, 
when he in uh, you know uh, went to when he, when he was exiled to uh to Akka and then after the revelation of all the letters he actually ordered that they would be placed or enshrined if you will into a a temple basically like a like a you know uh five pointed star if you will like a temple of man and this tablet is not included in there the 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 second tablet uh to napoleon the third which oftentimes people mistake as the first tablet but it's not uh that's the second tablet uh so and 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 there's a good reason as you can see it does not have the same tone the proclamatory tone all the other tablets the tone is very similar Mm -hmm. uh this is a very unique tablet in its own Mm -hmm. that it it has a very subdued and more of a subtle i mean it's it's a very meek and as the guardian puts said unprovocative you know Mm -hmm. tone and and uh so it, it may eventually uh be included in the summons of the lord of hosts i would think that it at least it's translation but uh there's no other translation of this or complete mm-hmm. translation than the one that I have provided here right yeah. now. Uh, let's see, there was another question that was interesting. Uh, where did it go? Um, one person asked about whether there had been any tablet, tablet to the Chinese emperor. So you might want to mention who received actual tablets and who are addressed in the Kitaba Akhtas. Uh, and perhaps well, a little bit about why. I assume a lot of it has to do with a- access to embassies and and such, it's not a matter of putting a stamp on a um, letter to no, the Chinese let me, emperor. No, let me tell you. Let me tell you the reason is no, the Chinese emperor was not significant. You have to understand, in the middle of the 19th century, the world was the the world was governed by oh. Europe. Okay, essentially, it was it was the age of colonization. Uh, China was a colony, was, it, was, was partly British, British colony. Uh, you know, Africa were all colonized. Yep. Most of Asia was colonized. India was colonized by the yep. Brit. So yes. the, the, as I say, the, the geopolitical center of the, uh, of, 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 the, of the world powers was in Europe. And the right. nations that, you know, wielded that, Baha'u'llah addressed all of them, okay? Right. And, and he also addressed in Surah Muluk all the kings as well, generally, uh, kings of the earth. So he would have addressed them, but he, mm-hmm. he chose to address those who wielded the most power individually. Mm-hmm. And I think that made perfect sense mm-hmm. because all the others, I mean, people ask about, you know, whether he addressed a letter to the, the uh, queen of Spain. I mean, Spain was not a significant political yeah. uh, player at the time. So yeah. uh, if you look at the history of the 19th century, you know, those were. Now, the, the Kitab Aqdas was really the, the, the excerpts in the Kitab Aqdas were really follow up, were part of in my other courses. I've talked about that this proclamatory phase of Baha'u'llah and his, his summons really took about, about seven years from 1866 to 1873, which culminated with the, you know, the revelation in the Kitab Aqdas. So um, the, he, there is reference and we will be addressing that in the second course in the fall. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I will be covering that. So we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves right now. The first three uh, prominent uh, rulers of Europe were, were, uh, Queen Victoria, uh, Napoleon, Napoleon III, and Tsar Nikolaevich Alexander II. So, the, and 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 he starts with them essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, it also makes sense because, for example, Kaiser Wilhelm is is addressed in the Octas, but this is before the birth of the modern German Republic. Exactly. Germany exactly. Was, was, in, in the exactly. 18, late Historically, 1860s was still yes. not anything. Yes, yeah. there was no. German Empire. It was. Yeah. It was. It was. Uh, Germ- it was the the largest German principality or kingdom was Prussia, and right. was becoming very powerful. It became actually a thorn on the side of the French, and became relevant in around 1866, right. around that time. And right. that was around the time that the uh, the Chancellor 
Otto von Bismarck came to power and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, and then they wanted to become a unified Germany and then right. Britain and France had issues with that and, and so right. on. So there was, there was this, this, this kind of political tug of war during that time. But yeah, right. uh, at this time, uh, we are looking at, um, you know, just, just the, 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 the top three, if you will. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And, and, and Austria, Hungary also at that time. Yeah, very weak. France, Joseph and Austria, Hungary was, he was, they were defeated by, in yeah. fact, there was a couple of campaigns, uh, you know, by, uh, like the battle of Solferino, that was that the Napoleon won, Napoleon the third won. And uh, so the Austro-Hungary was, was actually shrinking and yeah. it, it didn't wield the same kind of power it did um, right. uh, maybe 20, 30, 40 years earlier. And yeah. uh, so, and I'll, again, I'll address that, you know, that we were, there's this evolutionary process where the powers came in. And I think if this is why it's so important to look at the history of Europe during that time, and then you will see and appreciate that Baha'u'llah focused or zeroed in on those uh, monarchs that were uh, true powerful rulers that wielded the most power, you know, and, 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 but yet he addressed all of them, you know, he did not, but he focused his attention on those who could make a difference. Like for example, right. Queen Victoria, uh, uh, Czar and, and Napoleon, if all three of them had got together, let's essentially, they, they could have pretty much changed the course of history of the world, you know, well, because of the, the expansions that they had. They had they, they, they pretty much covered everything, you know, yeah. at that time, uh, well, and, as far as lands and powers, you know. Yes. And, and if there were other European, I mean, Belgium, Belgium had a king, that's the right. Netherlands had had monarchy. The uh, yeah, they're very small. Denmark and it, Sweden it, did too. So there were plenty, right. there were other choices. That's right. You're right. He was he was writing the powerful ones, and what he was saying was meant to be representative exactly. of his message to exactly. monarchs in general. Exactly. Like, there, there were there were there were lots of kings. Let's put it that way. There were a yeah. lot of kings that that were sort of you know throughout. I mean, yeah. there were lots of German like German, and you know, and then then, then you had you know, kings of Hungary and, you know, you had, you know, the, the places that were vassals. Some of these yeah. kings were actually vassals to other, you know, great nations, yeah. but yeah. The, the most powerful were really Britain, France at this time. Uh, and then, you know, uh, and Russia and then Germany, the unified Germany actually came to play after 1870 because yeah. they another, became another unified. Decade. A lesson, you know, at the expense of Napoleon III's fall. Right. And, yeah, and not so. long after that, also, of course, you have a king in Italy, but you don't have, you don't have a king of Italy at this yeah. time. Writing at Pope this Pius time, IX, at this time Pius most of the, charge. yeah, this was around the time, I think I may, you know, this is the period of Risergimento in Italy, where you had, uh, there was the Italian unification. So you, you now have uh, the, the, the Pope was losing, essentially right. all of Italy was under Pope, yes. uh, particularly the Pope that Baha'u'llah addressed, Pope Pius IX, but eventually his kingdom just shrunk to really what, what, what it is today, the Vatican, like the part of the city of Rome, not even the entire, uh, you know, uh, city of, you know, Rome. So, so th- this, this is something that is, is, is is occurring it's very dynamic while everything is happening so again uh pope was the leader of the catholic church but was also uh the 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 king or the uh the ruler of papal states you know and but that that really is uh it it was in jeopardy so again uh you know Again, we, we, keep, we keep coming back to the three major ones, you know, the right. major monarchs being being the, the three that we're addressing in this course. Yes. Sure. And, and the Pope, of course, the Pope, of course, is being addressed because he, he's in charge of the, the largest block of Christendom. So he's also has Napoleon did some really interesting things. I mean, we don't have time to really get into it. But, for example, he assisted the Italian reunification huh. efforts. But to, to appease the Catholics, because he was a Catholic himself, even 
by name, he actually didn't really believe in God, you know, in some ways he just didn't. And he was a philanderer and we'll get to that a little bit as well. And uh, uh, yeah, he just, he was, he was, he was only interested in, 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 in his own, you know, longevity and, and his own sure. success. Uh, sure. But anyways, uh, so then, then he sent his army because when, when the Italian re Unification almost choked the, the the papal state to sort of almost out of existence. But in order to 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 keep them at least a little bit of it, then he sent an army to protect the papal <laughs> papal. Uh, you know, protect the Vatican. Yeah, say, you know, <laughs> yeah. enough is enough. You, you know, yeah. you can you've got most of Italy. Let's just leave this little part to the one uh, square mile. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. Just, that's that's what it that's it. But he was he played both sides. He was a very scheming politician, huh. and all he was interested in is is his his own self aggrandizement. I mean, that's really what what his ultimate uh, goal was. You know, so a, a couple of other interesting questions here. One person again is asking about the Comte de Gobin, Gobineau, whether he was the author of the essay on the equality inequality of human races, and of course the answer is. Yes, he was. Yes. He's he's a notorious yes. racist by twenty first yes. century standards. He's, he's considered he's considered the like father of racism. Yep. Uh, I mean, it's really it's it's actually I think Mujan in his book really puts it. It says it seems a bit uh, awkward that the, the the first book that actually announced the the Bobby religion to the West was written by one of the most racist people yep. on earth, and yet yep. the. Bobby Baha'i religions are so anti-racial, you know, and uh, yeah, in, in their teachings. So yes, I mean, <laughs> the works, the works of Gabino were actually taken, brought to the United States, and were translated, and uh, by some of the, the the racist advocates in in the 19th century. I mean, if you if you explore that, if you look at look at actually biography of Gabino, you will see that he, uh, you know. He was uh, definitely, and, and he, he looked at it, I mean, he looked at it in a very interesting way. He was not hostile, but he was racist. He, yeah. he said, that's just the way it is. He basically, yeah. that's, that's the yeah. way he put it, you know, that, you know. Yeah. And this is it. before the rise of modern anthropology, yeah, yeah. before the rise of modern sociology, before yeah. the, uh, the real, the, the encounter between the Europe Europe and the rest of the world had gotten to the point where the Europeans were being increasingly were forced to realize that there was brilliance in the other religions and great depth in other cultures. And uh, that really is the late 19th and early 20th centuries when, when that, that understanding begins to sink in more and more. There's yeah. still the early, in the middle, early part of the 19th century, there's still sort of saying, hey, we got the gunboats. We're yeah. taken over. There yeah. was definitely a Definitely that that sense. Uh, well, throughout most of the nineteenth century, really. Yes. So, so, so remember when he published uh, that uh, his famous book? It was eighteen sixty five, and that was a year after the the the, the U.S. Civil War, right? Yep. I believe, or just about. You know, so yep. again, just at the end, late, at the end, yep. and I think Lincoln's assassination was in yep. in eighteen sixty five as well. So, so this book came at a, around that time and uh um so yeah it's uh, and, and just a few years after origin of the species by darwin too yeah which yeah. brings the idea of evolution into existence so exactly it spreads exactly. it around but lots lots were happening around this time you know yeah. where baha'u'llah is actually addressing the uh the world you know yeah. and and uh yeah another interesting question someone says asks about the very last tablet of the uh the last sentence of the tablet that you, you translated uh do you think that napoleon the third baha'u'llah was asking napoleon the third to uh, to to give him exile to accept them into france there is that kind of almost tone there yes of course you know um in in some ways yes to 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 basically Asylum, you mean? I mean, basically, yeah. to ask for an asylum. Yeah. I mean, yes, in some ways, Baha'u'llah had already received asylum from uh, from uh, Sultan Abdul uh, uh, Majid, uh, not Sultan Abdul Aziz, you know. But this this is uh, where the Iranians were trying to get uh, the, the Baha'u'llah and his 
small band of followers to 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 basically come and take them and then take them to Iran and basically destroy them uh, because after the exile. So you know, throughout the late 1850s and early 1860 till about 1861, uh, the the Sultan kept resisting Abdul Hamid Abdul Majid kept resisting. His brother, by the time he came to power, it took a number of years, but by that time, um, the, the Ottomans basically had given Baha'u'llah and his followers Ottoman citizenship. And then they, they, you know, they invited them to Constantinople and then to later on exile them to uh, Adrianople and all. So at that time, you know, so they were under the protection of the Ottomans, but the Ottomans mistreated them. So here, in some ways, yes, in some ways, Baha'u'llah is asking, it's kind of leaving, leaving it open-ended to the emperor, the way right. he's not telling him what to do. He's telling him what to do, but he doesn't tell him specifically what to do. Right. You know, I mean, he says, he says we're, we're oppressed. You're the champion of the oppressed. Do something about it. You know, right. you know? bring us under your protection, which he right. could have done very easily. Uh, because he had, you know, and I mean, the, the Ottomans would have been very happy to get rid of the, 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 the Baha'is and the Azalis, you know, because it was causing so much headache sure. for them that particularly the infighting that was happening in Adrianople. Uh, so, and that's why they decided to banish Baha'u'llah because of that uh, to, to Akka and Mirza Yahya to Cyprus. So it's... Uh, but this is around the time that, uh, you know, that the emperor, uh, Napoleon III, could have done something. But as, as I will tell you next time, he also would have uh, infuriated some other people if he would have done that. So anyway, I, I, we can, we can, I think it's worth pointing out that Baha'u'llah was offered asylum by the Russians and turned them down. Also, Yes, that was a that was an early that was an early under a different emperor. Uh, it was Nicholas the first. Uh, it was, you know, we're talking about 1850, uh, 253. It was during, you know, the start of almost the start of the Crimean war. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was prior to that. It was in the midst of the Crimean war that emperor Nicholas the first died and his son, uh, mm -hmm. Alexander the second came to power. Um, and then he had to deal with the war and, and so on and so forth. But, but yes, um, I mean, Ru Russia was, was so, I mean, it was a land that was really foreign to, to Baha'u'llah and, you know, to his, even his culture, whereas right. Iraq and, and that kind of part of the uh, Fertile Crescent is was 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 still part of the you know the the lands that was familiar the culturally you know was still the Middle East you know and linguistically so, yeah so yeah Russia I you know I mean it was a good gesture Baha'u'llah acknowledges yeah. that we will yeah. we will see that Baha'u'llah actually does acknowledge the uh, the fact that he was he was given solicitude and the invitation and he he says that for that reason God has you know, uh, has has designated a special reward for the emperor, but uh, for the for the czar. But anyways, we'll get to that when we study the tablet to the czar. Right. But uh, well, I, I, I brought that up because I, I somehow don't think that Baha'u'llah was seeking to move to a Paris suburb like Khomeini, for example, uh, a century later. Um, but uh, that, yes. uh, presumably Definitely whatever no. help Napoleon I mean, the third would have offered would not have been the no, opportunity I, I think to settle. Baha'u'llah just wanted this the, the persecutions to stop. Yeah. I mean, it was just relentless persecution for so long, so many years, and it was just not stopping. And yeah. and he was obviously both as the leader of a community that is very beleaguered, yep. and also as the representative of God on earth. He felt that the cause of these innocent people that are, you know, and he very graphically describes what, what was happening, you know, to the families, people being sold like slaves. I mean, you know, men and then women also in this very similar way. If you read the tablet uh, closely, it's all about the sufferings of, of the people.
both in the prayer and, and in the text. It's almost he repeats it again in, in, when he's addressing the, the emperor and basically tells him that, you know, we, we are, this, this is the evidence. I'm telling you, we are the most oppressed. There's no other oppressed group of people on this earth and since you are the champion of the oppressed, come and mm-hmm. rescue us. You know, yeah. so that yeah. that was really the challenge to him indirectly, but yeah. uh, but obviously fell fell on deaf ears. Yeah. So one one more actually, there may be two more, but there's at least one more, and that's a very interesting question from Gary. Uh, fascinating presentation. Could you please comment on Baha'u'llah's ability as an exile to comprehend contemporaneously the position and import of Europe and these individual monarchs in the world of his day? Well, again, um, there's two elements. There is, a, there, is a, uh, there is a spiritual element, and then there is the, the physical element of the world. I mean, obviously, um, newspapers were uh, you know, uh, available at that time, and uh, the news of the nations were, were being, you know, I know someone who kept really abreast of it was Abdul Baha. You know, he, yes. he read the newspapers of the day and so on. And, uh, um, but obviously the, the manifestation of God is omniscient. He, he is aware of, of what's going on in the world. I mean, he, he talks about a, uh, an arms race that was taking place, uh, yes. you know, between particularly Germany and France with his modern, like the, this is around the time when machine gun was invented. It was originally invented in France or the breech loaded, you know, howitzer guns and all that that were being used, uh, you know, that uh, was modern warfare, you know, yeah. and uh, navies were starting to become later in the next decade or so. They were not made out of woods anymore. The, uh, yeah. uh, the ships were actually, uh, you know, were made out of yeah. steel, you know, and uh, so things were really, really changing. And, 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 and God was alarmed by that. And he warned them, he said that you must stop this. And in fact, it was this arms race that later on led to uh, the First World War. Most uh, mm-hmm. historians of the second half of the uh, 19th century, all the academics now, without a shadow of a doubt, all agree that it was the, the arms race and the political uh, intrigue between the nations in Europe that kind of set the stage for the First World War, uh, you know. And, uh, you know, Abdul Baha, when he came to Europe, he said, he said the, something to the effect that the, uh, Europe is like a tinderbox. Yeah. That, that, you know, it, and, and it, it, can, it can be set ablaze at any moment. And it, it was. I mean, yep. a simple assassination in Sarajevo set the, set the war on, you know, you know the yep. course of the war. War on fire. Of, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So he said so, that six times in North America in 1912. Yeah. Six times. Six yeah. times? Okay. Six well, times. Yeah. So, so definitely, yes, Baha'u'llah was really quite aware because remember, the Ottomans were uh, considered by the Europe as the sick man of Europe at this time. I mean, that's how they refer to him, the, 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 um, the Ottoman or the, the Turkish question that was always in the minds of. So, so they were trying to somehow create, and they had Russia breathing down the neck of the Ottomans. And so the Europe's were trying to kind of, uh, you know, be the uh, arbiters, if you will, like the Western Europe, you know, right. nations. And later on, we, we have Germany and then, but Germany came to power after the 1870s, really. Right. Uh, but up to that, and France kind of went out. Uh, it, it became, it went from a first, first nation uh, or the first power to a fourth rate power, as the Guardian <laughs> actually says, <laughs> you know, it was the fourth rate power uh, mm-hmm. because it just, it just, it became chaotic after the fall of the second empire. France went into a period, a long period of, you know, um, chaos, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it didn't really, it didn't really emerge as a as a power until the beginning of the twentieth century. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, on a on a kind of a global scale, it didn't recover. But, uh, it did not recover. Did not yes. Recover. That's, yeah, exactly. Oh, from that. So it's interesting. Uh, yeah. 
Okay. Well, I think we're we're pretty much done because those those are the questions that we've got, and okay. uh, that's very good. Thank you for this fascinating presentation today about this first tablet, the tablet most of us have never seen before, and uh, uh, it's very good to have a provisional translation available. I'm sure the students in our course will very much enjoy uh, further discussions about this tablet in the next two weeks because we have two weeks to to comment about it. And then two weeks from now, of course, uh, the next three presentations are not available to the public. At least they won't be for maybe a year or so. We will eventually uh, mm -hmm. make them available. In fact, we're going to make, on, on Sharok's request just today, we'll make uh, the uh, tablets to the, uh, the Lohi Rais, the Surrey Rais, and Lohi Fawad uh, available. And I think, I don't remember whether the Lohi Sultan and the Surrey Moluk are available. Yes, yes, they are. The Surrey yeah. Moluk. <clears throat> Look, all four parts and and Lohisultan, all four parts have been for years. So, so we'll make we'll make people are yeah. So so we, oh. it would it would be nice to get the uh, the rest of the uh, the the last course, which is the on the on the Turkish prime ministers, yep. uh, um, and also um, so maybe you can uh, tell the audiences who are not registered for the course that they can still register for the course if they're interested i can put in the chat the uh address of the uh i'll get to the uh, i just turned off the chat sorry i won't turn just turning it on if if people go to http colon slash slash wilmet institute dot org i don't have it spelled right so i don't want to make that available to people just yet in toot still don't quite have it spelled right i'm using the wrong keyboard there we go so they go to women's um, dot org they will find uh on the menu across the top uh extension courses or, or community learning courses there's two two course tabs and one of them will take them to the list of current courses and there they will find um, the course God Summons Europe uh, right there available. And you can click on it to read about it and you can register for it. And the cost of the course is $95. But if people can't afford that, there are various discounts. And they can also write us and request a scholarship. So there's, we will make it available to people for a lower rate than that. But we do need to cover our costs as much as possible. So that's a way to register for the course. We already have. Uh, well, it's not a huge number of people, but we're, we've got plenty of room for more. And we look forward to further discussion over the next couple of weeks about this tablet and then on to the second tablet and then the tablet to Tsar Alexander II and on to the tablet to Queen Victoria. So it should be quite uh, good. I guess someone has just put the exact link to God Summons Europe now uh, in, the, in the chat. So before we close this, be sure to click on it if you want to look at it. So I think that's pretty much all the questions we have. Several people have thanked you very much. They said this is a fascinating presentation. As always, Sharoch, you, you do a very good job and always keep, all, keep us quite interested in, in these, these topics. And we look forward to hearing uh, from you further in the future.